Praise the Lord. We are studying the law of God. Amen. Let's look at principle number one. All Christians have died. Principle number one. All Christians have died. The Apostle Paul stated in the books of Romans and Galatians that if humans accept Christ in faith for their forgiveness of their sins, then God the Father reckons that they all died with Jesus Christ when he died on the tree of crucifixion. To Apostle Paul, Christ had become a substitute sacrifice for all Christians. Christ has become a substitute sacrifice for all Christians. So Christ Jesus performed a special dying for other people when he died on their behalf. So Paul said, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That is, Christ died in Paul's place. Beloved, this is what I want you to repeat in your mind till your heart grabs it. That you died even the very day you were born because of this sinful nature that you carried, you were born into. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. In sin did my mother conceive me. The very day you were born, you were born into sin because you live in this flesh. The flesh, this human flesh, is automatically a sinful nature because of Adam. And so we were born automatically into sin. And the punishment, the ultimate punishment that was there for the sin was death. But this is what the blood of Jesus did for you and myself. This is where we have to see the true importance, the true value of what Jesus Christ, if you hear the name Jesus, let it resonate. Let it ring in your bell. The one who died, who took my place. The one who took my punishment. That innocent blood. Instead of you shedding your blood for your sin. The sin that was automatically imputed into you because of this skin that you came in. As long as you were born by human, you are sinful. So let's understand this so that you value and appreciate your salvation, beloved. You and I, we must value Christ died in my place. Christ died in your place. So any lifestyle that you are living, ask yourself, is that the appreciation for what Christ did? As long as you live, know that someone took your punishment, which is death sentence. If you've not been to court before, please make an excursion, make a trip. Make a visitation to court, the courtroom, and witness a notorious criminal that the, the Supreme Court or the judge will put their cane, their, that big uh, uh, box, you know, wood, and say, bang, 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 found guilty. You are sentenced to death. Go and witness that and let it ring a bell. That was what the very day you came out of your mother's womb and cried, nah! that very day you cried, nah! that judge, judgment, that punishment was imputed into you. You were to die 
and be eternally separated from God Almighty. The one who gave you the life to even came to come out of that womb. I need you to get this picture because if, if you don't get it, you cannot appreciate what the blood has done for you. And you will serve Jesus anyhow. You will worship him anyhow. And that is why people, many churchgoers are anyhow Christians. Because they don't know the kind of, the, really what Christ has done. If you know, if you be in the know. So this very day, you now know that the very moment you came out of your mother's womb, that judgment beat came. Found guilty. Punishment, life, death, eternally. Eternal condemnation. Unlimited death. Separation from the Father. Paul took your place. I mean, Jesus took your place. Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 to 20. Make time and read the book of Romans, the chapter 6, 7, and 8, and then the book of Galatians 4 and 5. From 2 to 5, read the entire book of Galatians. Meditate upon it. Apostle Paul looked on himself as one who already died. Who already died. He believed all Christians also already died. The central doctrine he boldly presented was that the whole of human race had already died. They were now all dead to sin. Galatians 2.19 In no way was Paul getting rid of the law. Let's not forget that. In no way was Paul getting rid of the law when he said that they were dead to sin. He simply said that the circumstances by which God charged humans had now changed. I'm going to repeat that. In no way was Apostle Paul getting rid of the law of God when he said that we were dead to sin. He simply said that the circumstances by which God judged humans had now what changed. Mankind had died. So to Apostle Paul, the law did not apply any longer in any factor regarding the Christian because the Christian was now reckoned to be dead in Christ. You and me. All the Christendom. God is not going to judge us based on the law. Because we are dead in Christ. So we Christians are like Paul's illustrations in the book of Romans. That if a husband dies, then the law that bound that husband and wife was no longer in force. Because the husband died. This meant that the wife was no longer married to the man. So before you accepted Christ Jesus, you were married to the law. And there was no way you could escape judgment through the law. All those who don't believe in Christ Jesus, they are married to the law of Moses, law given to Moses, and every the 613 laws. But anybody who believes in Christ, God is no longer going to judge you through the law. Because you and the law have separated in the sense that Christ died for you. Christ did what? Died for you. And so the laws that bonded you and the law of God to be married and to be judged with is no longer there is gone is dead if a husband be dead she is free from that law wherefore my brethren you are become dead to the law by the body of christ when christ died and became a substitute for us but now we are delivered from the law that been dead 
wherein we were held. Romans chapter 7 verse 3. Please rewind the audio, the video till you get it. Because you need to understand this. Apostle Paul stated that we had been legally in a marriage state by being attached to Israel. We had been legally in a married state by being attached to Israel. But now the husband of that marriage had died and we were being called collectively a widow. So you and I, the Christendom, we are collectively called a widow because our husband, the law of Israel, the law given to Israelites, is dead because Christ died. The old covenant was such a marriage relationship between Israel and God. God took Israel like a, a woman being married to a man. So when you read the book of Ezekiel 16, God was describing how he saw Israel like a, like a young man, describing how he saw a young lady and, and married and, and saw that he, he was mature, she was matured for marriage and entered into a covenant with, with, with her and, and decorated her, adorned her with jewels and all that, which some pastors misinterpreted. So we, all believers who came to believe in God Almighty, because many weren't even serving God, they were serving idols. So once you now come to believe in God Almighty and not worship Him through an idol, you were married to the law that bonded the Israelites physically. And as you came to believe in Jesus Christ, you have become a widow, dead. Your husband, the law of Israel, is dead. I pray you, you, you catch this, this knowledge, this truth. So the old covenant was such a marriage relationship between Israel and God. But when the husband, Christ, died, but when the husband who is Christ, died. That death ended the old covenant between Israel and God. The nation of Israel is now considered a widow. So, at, so looking at principle one, there is utter simplicity in Paul's meaning. Whereas the first marriage of the woman of Paul's illustration was holy, righteous, and good, and lasted until the death of the husband, so too, so too, the law of God that the Father gave to ancient Israel was a very holy thing. It was righteous and good, and lasted until Christ died for mankind. Yet, and even, and in spite of the law being holy, righteous, and good, the law had some powerful and unwelcome negative aspect associated with it. The law has an unwelcome and powerful aspect associated with it. Negative aspect, you may ask. That's right. Apostle Paul in the book of Romans spent considerable time rehearsing what were the negative factors in the law of God. And they were very upsetting indeed. In fact, to get rid of these negative features surrounding the law, Apostle Paul said that all Christians died in Christ when Christ died on the tree of crucifixion. This was the central core of Paul's teaching. This was the central theme of Apostle Paul's teaching. Now, the Apostle Paul did not consider anything wrong with the first marriage of the widow in his illustration. And get it in your mind, you are part of the widow now, just like the physical Israelites. For while that marriage was in force, Christ had not yet died for the sins of the world. So even when Jesus came, Jesus was under the law. Jesus came and operated under the law. When he was when he was eight days old, he was taken 
and all spiritual things was were performed he was taken to the temple for uh, all the things that needed to be done under the law for Jesus operated under the law when he was here but after his death that was where the the that marry a uh, law covenant was broken after his death so i i pray that you really get this understanding i really really pray that you really get this understanding he paul didn't consider the first marriage of the widow in the illustration he made in romans chapter 7 it wasn't wrong at all because while that marriage was in full force christ had not yet died for the sins of the world but there were negative factors associated with the old covenant and that negative factors it held as bondage that old covenant because of all people including israel were held in bondage to the consequences of breaking that law that law of god and that old covenant demanded be kept so anybody that broke that bondage if you make time make time and read exodus leviticus leviticus numbers deuteronomy exodus exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy make time and read that book you you know all the 613 laws you know it and once you know it and how people were punished for breaking the law you will come to appreciate what the blood of jesus did for you paul knew that not only israelites but all the world were condemned and headed for severe judgment and chastisement for their sins that they committed under the law of god these were the principal negatives attached to the constitutional framework of the law of god there was no way to be saved from those negatives as long as the law held a person captive to it holy and uh, uh, just requirements there was no way around it there was no pardon for it mere animal sacrifices on the day of atonement or any other sin offerings were not sufficient to solve the problem of recurrent sins breaking of god's law human beings consistently found within their normal lives while they were under the law there was no way every day we are sinning every day every day so no amount of human sacrifices uh, uh, animal sacrifices on the day of atonement could do anything after each sacrifice for sin all all that was done mankind will go back to it after each sacrifice for sin all knew as point uh the apostle paul pointed out that people kept on sinning and sinning and death sentences continued over each person who found him or herself breaking this law of god what was the law of god to apostle paul what was the law of god what was the law of god that that is what we want to look at it is important in theological sense to know that what paul considered to be the law of god about which he wrote we need to understand to show this galatians chapter 4 verse 21 to 31 paul gave the illustration of sarah and hagar to understand the law of god paul gave illustrations a very practical example that happened between abraham's wife sarah and sarah's uh, servant maid servant hagar or hagar the wife of the wife which is sarah and the concubine of abraham which is hagar mentioned in the book of genesis it is interesting that paul even called his illustration a teaching of the law make time and read galatians chapter 4 verse 21 to 31 in jewish and biblical terminology the first book of the bible is called initial book of the law which is the book of genesis so when paul taught of the law of god 
he included laws given to Adam, other laws given to Noah, those given to Abraham, and all, and also all those given to Moses and Israel at the time of Exodus. All these laws were commands that were good and right, but Paul found them impossible to keep in a perfect sense. Nobody could keep it, be perfect at it. Nobody. There were many negatives to human welfare associated with earlier law of God. This is what Paul indicated when he said, And the commandment which was ordained unto life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it, by that commandment, slew me. When you read Romans chapter 7, verse 10 to 11, that was what Paul said over there. The same commandment, the same law, which was supposed to help me live, it is that same law that killed me, because he couldn't keep it. He couldn't keep it. Even Jesus Christ, when he came, he called out some of the uh, Pharisees on how they bend the law of God to suit themselves because they couldn't keep it. They made their own law to go about. They made a runabout around the actual law of God. And in their mind, they thought they are still obeying the law of God. And that is why Jesus called them out and called them hypocrites. Indeed, everyone who lived under the law of God before the death of Christ on the tree of crucifixion was utterly condemned by that very law ordained to give life to those who keep it perfectly. The word perfectly easily condemned all humans. The word perfectly. Nobody, not even Moses. And that is why he couldn't even enter Canaan. Not even Moses. Whom the scripture said God was speaking to mouth by mouth, word for word. He couldn't keep it. Nobody could. Nobody will ever will be able to keep. Yes. Nobody perfect. There's nothing perfect. This was the profound negative attached to the law. And at last, no one was ever able to keep God's commandment from the time of Adam to that of Christ. Yes, nobody could keep it. Paul stated a cardinal truth when he taught that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. And there were no decrees, no decrees in law breaking in the eyes of God. There were no degree. You can't put, oh, I, I did small, small amount. It was not that some laws were more important to God than the others, or that some were reckoned by him to be severe and others as mild in interpretation. You know, God didn't see any of those laws lesser or harsher. They were all his laws. In no way was that true. In God's view, even a minor transgression of the law meant that all the law in its entirety had been broken. If you don't understand what I just said, read James chapter 2, verse 10. If you break one, if you observe the study day as a, as a Sabbath and go and steal or covet, be jealous, you've broken the study day. Study day doesn't count. Nobody could keep the law. So if someone thinks that he is obeying God's law by uh, not doing any work on Saturdays and whatever, but still they get angry to the point of jealousy and anger, forget about the study day that you are serving God. It doesn't count to God. Nobody could keep the law perfectly. We tell you the truth. Under the law, man was in a hopeless state because he found himself consistently sinning with perhaps a few brief periods of temporary relief. Unrelenting, the law of God habitually reminded mankind of his degenerate and desperate state. So the law was like a constant reminder. Every day, every day you are in fear and panic and, and you, you are reminded of your, your rotting state. 
the law always revealed to man in a negative sense the law always revealed in a negative sense his sinning nature mankind our sinning nature and that the law issued a death warrant a death warrant that continually loomed over man and awaited him eventually because of persistent sins because we couldn't stop sinning there was no way today you can be holy tomorrow you are angry you are cursing out you are doing what god does the law doesn't say we should do so that warrant was always on man this disclosure to man of man's unrighteousness by statement within the law was a profound negative appraisal it disturbed paul and the other apostles with remorse yeah and that is why he, he kept saying that you know he kept paul kept saying that that which i want to do i'm not able to do but that which i am not able i the thing that is right i want to do i'm not able to do it but the weird thing that i don't want to do that's what i keep doing it disturbed paul apostle paul it disturbed him so let's keep the principle the principle one the first principle in mind let's keep that in mind while the former marriage of the widow in apostle paul's illustration was fine and holy and good there was no way to get out from under the law's definition of sin and its negative consequences until the death of one of the parties to that former marriage relationship so god's law was god telling man or the israelites how he want to relate to them in the covenant he has made with them and they couldn't keep it so whilst god with his law and israelites mankind was in marriage agreement the law was what bound binding us together so one had to die for the law to be broken that is why god separated himself from himself and called him christ to come and die so once death occurs the law is broken i pray you get this keep that <laughs> keep that principle in mind all christians had died amen keep that illustration that apostle paul made in mind so that you can really really understand what the death of christ has done for you every day there was a constant reminder of how sinful we are oh if you make any offense how you have to go and look for a goat or a sheep or a cow or a dove a turtle dove to go and appease god keep that in mind that was the state of mankind before the death of christ before the death of christ so when jesus died on the tree of crucifixion he took with him all the sins of israel and also all the sins of the world on his back romans chapter 3 verse 16 to 17 so for God so loved, uh, no, John chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. John 3, 16 to 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. And what does the 17 say? The 17 add, God sent his son unto the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him hallelujah any minute any second any moment you get thank jesus for his blood let's thank jesus for his blood christ died in place of all israelites and all human beings as a substitute on their behalf so that all are now reckoned dead to the old relationship that humans had with god before christ forgave humans of their sins so apostle paul sum it all up sum up this teaching 
in an admirable way in 2 Corinthians chapter 14 to 21. Note how Paul showed that all humans, not just Israelites, are reckoned to have died with Christ when he died on the tree of crucifixion. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. You deserve to die. I deserve to die. And Christ took your place and died for you. So if you truly claim that you have really, really, really have come to believe in Christ and have given your life to him, then what must you do? Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, he said, take my yoke upon yourself for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So he said that for the love of Christ constrains us. The love that you have for Jesus for taking your eternal punishment, it should constrain you from sinning and now when somebody smack you on the face he said because christ took my eternal punishment i will turn my other cheek for the love that you have for christ because he took he broke that burden of you keeping a perfect law that you could never keep none of us could ever would have ever been able to keep Everything that you owe, including material things, money, everything, should be in sacrifice to lift the name of Jesus high in all remote places, in every place till everybody gets saved and not to be punished under the law. You are obligated, I am obligated. Because if you get to understand that he took your place, he exchanged. There was an exchange of life, your life, my life, for God's love. God knew you couldn't do it. He's a holy, perfect God. You couldn't match up to his standard. And he had to do something about it. Beloved, he had to do something about it. So no longer are you and myself should be able to live for ourselves anymore. You are dead. You died when Christ died. Now he lived inside your body. Your, gra your, gratitude, your gratitude to him is that henceforth my emotions, my feelings is dead. I am dead. I am dead to my sins. I am dead to sins. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 14, chapter 5, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. Beloved, you must die to your old life if you really, really know that Christ died for you. Any old life, any past life that you are in, from today, it ceases. You stop it immediately. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we ought, at one time we thought of Christ nearly from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and what a new life has begun. If anybody is in Christ, is a new creation. The old life is what? It's going away. 
the new life is gone. So how dare you still continue to tag that, that brother in Christ, that sister in Christ for their past life? How dare you? Beloved, Christ died, the same Christ who died for you died for that armed robber who says he has given his life to Jesus. So never we negate people's life, still tag them negatively. For Christ has replaced his old life with his life. If you see your brother, you must see Christ. If, I, if you see me, you must see Christ. You should, in your mind, perceive that I am looking at Christ. Grace, old grace is dead. The old grace who used to talk anyhow, talk to people anyhow, I am dead. Now Christ lives. So when I'm about to speak to a sister, a brother, I think through and speak it as Christ would have spoken. When that husband is talking to you, you speak to him as you would speak. Christ would have spoken to, to the husband. When, when, when you are a husband, you are talking to your wife. You speak to that wife as Christ would have spoken to that woman. When you are speaking to your children, you speak to them as Christ would have spoken to them. And know that Christ loved children. So those, who, those of us who have been messing our children up, being wicked and mean to them, screaming, I am, the, I am a chief sinner. In this, may the Lord have mercy. Including our children, we must treat them as Christ would treat them. We must treat them. Verse 18, it says, And all of this is a gift from God. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, it says, Who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. God has given you and me. The task that the Hindu people, the Buddhists, the Muslim, we must go and explain this to them. That they can never please God. They can never go to God unless through Christ. Unless through Christ. Because they trying to keep the Sharia law, the five pillars of Islam, whatever it is, will never make them right with God. The perfect God, the holy God, the just God. It is through the death of Christ. They must come to accept Christ. They must come to know and acknowledge him. Or oh, Christ, God doesn't see them. You and I, we hold that task. If you are not able to tell that Muslim friend of yours, that co-worker of yours, that, you know, person you meet all the time, about this secret, about this truth, you have, you have an answer to give God. We have... Verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 5 says, God has given you and I the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ. For God was what? In Christ, reconciling the world to himself. No longer counting people's sin against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. Hallelujah. We are what? Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So no longer are we to uh, sacrifice turtle, dove, uh, goat, cows, any camel, anything for, 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 for God, to God again for our sin. So if any pastor, any bishop tells you, if any pastor, any bishop, anybody tells you that you must pay $200, $150, whatever the currency is, so that God can forgive your sin, it's a lie. The blood of Jesus pays it all, but we owe it to Christ. For that exchange that he did, that we do greater works for him. For we believing in him, others have to also believe in him. Others have to come to this truth that without Christ Jesus, they are still under that bondage. And no amount of sacrifice can make them perfect with God. No amount of their trying to live a righteous life through their own human works will work out. You can never please God with your own strength. It takes the Holy Spirit 
Hallelujah. It takes the blood of Jesus. And that is why our mind needs to be renewed. Amen. Our mind needs to be renewed. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. 